This week on the Green Left News Podcast, Venezuela's election results, and Sue Bolton talks to us about campaigning with the community. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of the Green Left News Podcast. My name's Isaac Nellis and I'm talking to you from Gadigal Country in Sydney. And this week I'm again joined by Riley Breen. Hi, and I'm joining you from uh, Lock Up Mother Land in Bulu, Perth. So uh, we've got a good podcast coming up. Where later on, we're going to be talking to Sue Bolton, who is a Socialist Alliance councillor in Marybeck uh, Council in uh, Melbourne, um, about the upcoming Victorian local government elections and some of the campaigns she's been involved in. Um, but before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge that we're meeting on stolen land that was uh, uh, never ceded and always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And Green Left pledges to stand with First Nations people in campaigns for justice, sovereignty and land rights. And also just mention quickly, if you like this podcast or any of the work that Green Left does, you can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. It's only st- starts at $5 a month and makes a massive difference to help us continue. Um, but our first topic of uh, the podcast today is uh, the elections in Venezuela. So the presidential elections took place on July 28. And there's been a bit of uh, confusion, a bit of controversy around the election results with initially both uh, the incumbent president, uh, Nicolas Maduro, and the opposition candidate, Edmundo Gonzalez, claiming victory. Um, So uh, the election results have been contested and uh, Maduro has continued acting as president and is claiming that the opposition was attempting to stage uh, a US-backed coup, but uh, the Maduro government has refused to release the official tally sheets um, with the actual uh, voting results. So what's actually going on? Um, To help explain this situation and give us a bit of an insight, we're joined by a co-author of Latin America's Turbulent Transitions, and a Green Left journalist who was formerly based in Caracas, uh, Federico Fuentes. Welcome back on the podcast. Uh, Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here about to be able to talk about such an important issue. Yeah, so I guess for people who haven't been able to follow this story at all, could you give us a bit of a background on the political situation in Venezuela prior to the elections? Yeah, I think always when when talking about Venezuela, uh, it might seem repetitive, but it is important to state a few basic facts, um, largely because for the last 20, 25 years, uh, Venezuela has been under a sustained uh, campaign of uh, anti-government propaganda, uh, propaganda aimed at undermining uh, the Bolivarian process, as it's referred to in that country. So I think some of the basic facts that are worth noting is that for much of the last decade, Venezuela has been under crushing sanctions that have had a devastating toll on its economy and on the people of Venezuela, with some reports estimating that the deaths resulting directly or indirectly from the sanctions are in the tens of thousands. It's also true that in Venezuela, starting with Hugo Chavez's election in 1998, um, but particularly after the defeat of a US-backed coup attempt in 2002, Venezuela has been undergoing a very important um, process of radical change a change that has uh, started to sow the seeds, or at least began to sow the seeds of socialist transformation uh, in that country under the presidency of of Chavez. I think another basic fact that's also worth pointing out is that for most of that time, or pretty much for all of that time, it's been a sustained campaign um, by the right-wing opposition and by the US government uh, to undermine, subvert, overthrow uh, the Chavez government, uh, and then subsequent to that, the Nicolas Maduro government, um, Nicolas Maduro being first elected in, in 2013. All those facts are important to note because they're often missing from the mainstream media discourse, but in and of themselves don't explain all of what happened in these last elections. In these last elections, which are largely the result of a process of negotiations between the opposition, who for the previous few elections had decided to boycott the elections on the basis that they believed that the electoral system was unfair and tilted towards the government. Um, In this process of negotiations, uh, they came up with a compromise of how the elections would be run uh, in return for some weakening of those sanctions um, that I mentioned. Uh, In that context, the opposition had first proposed to run Marina uh, uh, Corina Machado, 
um, someone who's clearly identified as being on the far right of the Venezuelan opposition, uh, but who was banned from being able to stand from office uh, by the by the Supreme Court. And so therefore, they went for a second um, candidate who was also barred from being able to run and finally settled on Emundo Gonzalez, the third choice candidate in some ways, if we want to put it that way, um, who politically is quite different from Maria uh, Karina Machado. Um, that's not to say that he wasn't backed by them, but he's a career, career diplomat. In fact, during the early years of Chavez even, was a, was a career diplomat during, during the Chavez government. The war was decided, the opposition basically decided they would throw their weight in behind Gonzalez with a sense that they could win win these elections. Um, there was an election campaign, uh, election campaign that it has to be said wasn't really fought over huge economic um, or political um, differences, uh, unlike the period of the Chavez government where the, the, the political polarisation was very clear and sharp. Um, here it was more a discursive uh, campaign with very little um, being offered in terms of actual um, protection of workers' rights, which have suffered greatly uh, in, in the last few years as a result of sanctions, but also government policies leading to workers having in Venezuela the lowest minimum wage in all of Latin America by far, and basically banning the right of workers to organise uh, strikes and to defend their collective enterprise agreements. So a pretty harsh regime really fa facing workers. That was a context of when Venezuelans went to vote uh, in, in July 28. And what we saw on that day was a large turnout by all accounts um, and large turnout, not just uh, uh, if we consider the fact that uh, according to the official results, um, it was a quite a large turnout, but also in a context where somewhere between four to eight million Venezuelans have left the country uh, who would have been eligible to vote, um, but were not allowed to vote uh, in, in these elections or had their voting, voting rights heavily restricted as a result of the negotiations that occurred between the government and the opposition. That was one of the demands that the government wanted to restrict overseas voting. Um, when we consider that seven, you know, some several million were not able to vote, the the turnout was was very high. Uh, but of course, as you mentioned in the in, in introduction, um, what has happened after, subsequent to that election um, is also very important for us to look at. Ah, uh, yeah. So the um, with the election being contested and uh, both Maduro and the right wing opposition claiming victory, uh, how have people responded to the initial result? Yeah, so on the night of the elections, there was quite a delay in the release of the results, at least traditionally for what it's like in, in Venezuelan elections. And usually late in the night, but not too late in the night. Um, you certainly at least have an indicative vote. And if obviously if the, the gap in vote is large enough, um, you know, sort of a trajectory can be traced, the projection can be made and, 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 a, and, a, and, a, and a victor declared. Uh, in this case, the, the results were quite late in coming out. And... There was quite a quite a strong reaction when those um, votes were released. Uh, it should be noted that even before the votes had been released, there were already starting to be celebrations from opposition supporters in the streets. And many had a very strong sense that they they had won uh, the results, uh, and were quite shocked to find out that the when the official results were announced that Maduro had won with 51, 52 percent of the vote, um, with the opposition candidate only only gaining about 43, 44 percent of the vote. And the rest of the votes shared amongst another seven or eight candidates that also um, stood in the elections. Of course, that that sentiment of celebration uh, then turned into uh, uh, outrage, uh, into into, and in some cases it should, has to be noted, uh, violent protest, um, including attacks on local PCV grassroots activists. We know of at least two cases where where they were assassinated. Uh, in violent actions that, that must be, re, you know, repudiated and, and, and you know, the full force of law must be brought down then. But overwhelmingly, the the, the protests themselves were, were largely peaceful, um, but were met with heavy state repression. Um, the, that, that anger continued to go for at least one or two more days because not only did the CNE take quite a, sorry, the CNE being the National Electoral Council, take quite a while to release the results, um, after that, it basically shut its office, uh, released no more communications for something like four more days. And to this day, more than 50 days after the elections, has refused to uh, release the full results of the elections. Um, that's despite it being a legal obligation of the CNE, and that's despite the Supreme Court ruling that it should publish th those results. So, of course, this has led many to, at best, question 
what has occurred at those elections, if not just outright reject what the CNE has said, uh, asking the very legitimate question that, well, if, if Maduro won and those votes are real, why, why aren't they showing the, the, the actual votes? But as I said, the protests themselves largely died down after a few days because of the quite heavy state repression. Maduro himself, I mean, this is, and when I talk about repression, I'm not just talking about what independent sort of human rights organisations have said, which many might question, oh, well, where do their funding come from? What are their political allegiances? Well, we can just take Maduro's word for what, what occurred in those days where he boasted on TV that more than 2,000 people had been rounded up. Uh, all of them uh, tried in, in without the right to a lawyer, tried in courts uh, designated for acts of terrorism, uh, most often tried in their prison cells rather than in the courts. Uh, in fact, two prisons were specifically set up uh, for uh, locking up, for jailing um, these protesters. So the the government certainly wasn't wasn't backwards in coming forwards about its its scale of repression that it unleashed in those days. And so what we have today is a continuing simmering sentiment that that just something isn't right about those election results and many wanting to see what what was the actual election result breakdown so that they can verify whether it was true what the CNE said in regards to the election outcome. Yeah, so um, just on this topic of the protests that took place and obviously you talked about the repression, I was just curious to know, uh, you know, who, which kind of uh, segments of the population were involved in some of these protests? Was it coming out of the poorer areas or was it more where the opposition was stronger? Uh, and what about the influence of the communes? Did, uh, how did they take the results? Um, and I guess that kind of leads to the, the next kind of question is why do you think the government and the National Electoral Council have refused to release the tally sheets despite all this pressure that is being put on them, um, both from within the country but also internationally? In terms of the results, again, you know, this is where it's worth back to going to what I said at the start, that there's a lot of important basic facts that are often left out of the discourse when it comes to talking about Venezuela, but that alone, they don't really answer what happened in these elections. Because whilst I said there's been many campaigns, many protests uh, aimed at subverting the government, subverting the constitutional order, uh, seeking to overthrow the government, in large part throughout most of those years, the most significant protests have always occurred mainly in lower middle class, up middle class, upper middle class areas. Um, that's always been the traditional support base of the opposition. This time around, it was quite different. This time around, the vast majority of the protests were actually in working class poor neighbourhoods. You could see that both in the terms of the news reporting of them. So the, the specific NGO in Venezuela that dedicates itself basically to tallying reports of, of protest. And their report tally was that there was you know, something like eight, nine hundred uh, protests all across the country. So we're not, not, you know, we're talking about lots of protests here, not, not a few scattered protests here and there. And that within Caracas itself, the capital, 80% uh, of those protests occurred in working class poor neighborhoods. Um, this has definitely not been the pattern uh, in, in previous protests. That's not to say there haven't been protests in those neighbourhoods. It's just not been the pattern. That they've, that's where the majority of these, these protests that have occurred. Now, I think that's largely in part because I think for most of the middle class areas, I think they kind of expected to just go to vote and, you know, that they, they really their vote wouldn't probably make too much of a difference. And they've sort of been demoralised by... 20 years of concrete defeats each time when they've been defeated, where the CNE has been able to publish the results and demonstrate um, that, that that the opposition ha had been lost. But this time around, because it was neighbourhoods where, I mean, and it's important to remember, then as one thing that occurred under as part of this Bolivarian process, and particularly under Chavez, was that people came to really defend their, their vote. Um, you know, under previous governments, and most times polling centres were barely set up in neighbourhood, in poor neighbourhoods. There was no interest in electoral enrolment um, because no one really wanted them, wanted the poor to participate in politics. And Chavez upended that, expanded the, the polling centres, ran big registration campaigns. And what this meant was that, you know, polling centres are all, all located all throughout poor neighbourhoods. People know who are working in those polling centres. People know who are the party observers for the governing party, for, for the opposition. So word of mouth gets around pretty quick. You know, people know what what vote happened in their local area they may not know what vote happened everywhere again because the cne refuses to publish it but they know what happened in their local area that's why they were starting to celebrate they they knew that they they had won it well at least they presumed that they they had won a won a victory and that's that's why we saw we saw that the these uh celebrations uh then then very quickly turned to protest the second part of your question was well why hasn't the cne um released those results 
Well, the first thing to say to that is that unfortunately the CNE itself, nor the government, nor any other institution has even bothered to answer that question, uh, despite, as I said, it being very clearly stipulated in the law, uh, being very clearly stipulated uh, in the Supreme Court ruling um, that, that occurred um, in, in August. Um, and one then asked us the question, well, okay, if they're not willing to provide an answer, one has to think, well, why wouldn't you release these results? And it's hard pressed to find a single legitimate reason why you wouldn't publish the results unless those results don't add up to the results you announced. Uh, there is no other explanation for it, um, particularly when, uh, as the CNE made it clear on the night of the elections, that it was going to do this. It precisely said it had the data that despite a, an attempted cyber attack that it claims occurred on, on the uh, automatic voting machine, that it had defeated that cyber that cyber attack and that it had the data, it had it on a CD that it was going to hand over to the opposition parties uh, as stipulated by law within 24, 48 hours. Um, releasing that data, if anything, would have decompressed the situation in the country, would have eased people's anxieties uh, for those who, you know, we're just asking questions. We're not necessarily convinced that Maduro hadn't won, but just we're wondering why Why is this all of a sudden different to what has happened in every other election up until now? Uh, the failure to release it as a result has only seemed to have the, 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 the effect of turning those who have been questioning the results into people who now pretty much accept that fraud has occurred in those results because there cannot be and there is no other explanation for why those results have not been published. Um, I was curious about something you, you mentioned earlier that um, there, are, there are seemingly only kind of minor differences between uh, between Maduro and the opposition. I was wondering if you could explain a bit more about that and what actually are the programmatic differences between between the two, and you know what what are the political divisions there? Yeah, look, if, if we want to talk about the actual programs that that both for the candidates stood on Nicolas Maduro and 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 Amundo Gonzalez. Um, it's not to say that there there wasn't dif there wasn't any differences, um, but they were differences of of shades of of policies. You know, so obviously, for example, Amundo Gonzalez was much more pro privatization, uh, but even he understands that in general in the Venezuelan population, there's not a huge appetite for just mass scale privatization of everything that is in in state and state hands so his program wasn't one of just you know it certainly wasn't one with which we could compare to say the ultra right candidate in argentina javier Milei, who you know basically de described the state as 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 equivalent to a pedophile in a in a kindergarten you know and, and that it needed to be destroyed and abolished and had no role to play in, in society whatsoever that was not quite Imundo gonzalez's um uh, platform. And similarly, on the other side, Maduro was hardly pr uh, proposing a program that would see more nationalizations or more workers' control of those those industries currently un under nationalizations. In fact, it, you know, largely both of them just sort of spoke about how we could return Venezuela to some kind of normality. You know, there was more a criticism of the other. So the opposition, well, meant you know, so from Maduro's case, it was the opposition meant you know, violence, coups, sanctions. And then from, from the oppositions, it was that, that Maduro meant more more poverty, you know, more 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 isolation from, from the rest of the world. That was the, the sort of main the main messages that that rang through um in, in, in the two campaigns. So that's what I mean by the, the lack of a real political polarization. Um and that's why at the end of the day most people didn't go to vote uh for something that they genuinely necessarily uh believed in or, or for some clear political program and most people that went to vote really went more to oppose the opposite so most of maduro's vote i think you could largely say was just people who definitely just didn't want to see the opposition in power you know they, they know what the opposition is they know that it's 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 policies of the last 25 years they know how the old traditional parties used to roll uh, um, uh, rule venezuela and so preferred to stay with what they had and for many other people who voted against Maduro and for the opposition candidate, they didn't vote for Gonzalez's political program. They voted because they were sick and tired of the Maduro government. Um, and that's what that's the vote that they cast on that day. Now, one can agree or disagree or, or whatever, but I think one should, at the bare minimum, uh, hold the position that in a democracy, when people go to have their votes cast, irrespective of why they've cast that vote, those votes should be counted 
They should be legitimately published and people should be able to verify whether those boats have been counted in, in the proper way. And unfortunately, in Venezuela's case, this has not happened since July 28. Yeah, so you've touched on the kind of impact of uh, the Hugo Chavez um, government and the, the Bolivarian uh, Venezuelan revolution as well, and how, you know, it broadened out uh, democracy in Venezuela and and had a lot of things that uh, people looking from afar like us uh, were quite, I think, are quite uh, ex exciting and inspiring. And um, I, I Green Left, as, as, as you were uh, based in Caracas at the time, and it's like uh, we've had a, a lot of um, connection to trying, trying to learn lessons from that, from that process. Um, but what does this mean now? Uh, does this muddy the waters? What does this mean for the future of the uh, Bolivarian project, the Venezuelan revolution? Um, yeah, could you speak to that? Well, I think the Bolivarian project, if 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 we speak about it in terms of the government, uh, if it's not already finished, is pretty much in it, in its death throes. Um, if we talk about the Bolivarian process in terms of the people's movements that were the backbone of the Chavez government, were the backbone of electing Chavez, of defeating the coup attempts in 2002, 2003, um, and have sustained through you know, the next 20 years of concerted US um, attacks on, on, on the Venezuelan government. I think that still exists. It's certainly battered, bruised, um, confused in the current context, uh, the, um, if not divided, certainly disorientated uh, as, to, as, to, as to move forward. I think, but it's it, that that definitely still exists. But you know, when you when you talk about the communes, for example, or the the, the sort of grassroots democracy, um, you know, we we have to acknowledge that even under Chavez, uh, these were, as I said at the start, you know, just seeds of the socialism. Or far from being some kind of completed system uh, of popular grassroots democracy that was running the country. And in fact. You know, Chavez in his very last speech, uh, one of his last speeches before passing away, precisely questioned the fact that why why was it that after so many years of laws and ministries set up to dedicate it to the communes and resources being put into it, that the communes still weren't functioning, still weren't existing. And this was in the heyday of the process. And even at that point, Chavez was very clear on the real limitations of where of how far that, that system had got that at best it was just the seeds of something new and far from being a completed project. Well, I think more than 10 years after his death, that situation is much worse than it was before. Of course, part of that, you know, again, as I said at the start, is the result of the economic sanctions. It's very hard to dedicate yourself to building a new, an entire new state from below built on participatory and protagonistic democracy when you have to spend most of your day actually just finding the dinner to put on the table for your kids. Uh, and that was at the peak of the, 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 the sanctions. We're talking 2017, 2018. That was, that was people's daily existence. It was spending the entire day figuring out how you could get just a couple of dollars um, so you could just buy that meal to make it to the end of that day. And then the next day it was the same and the next day it was the same. So, you know, obviously that's going to have an impact on how much people can participate in grassroots democracy. But it's also the case that the government's policies on, on these issues have changed. And the Chavez, Chavez was very clear. You know, he said that in order to get rid of poverty, you've got to give power to the people. As a result of what we've seen in the last few years, that's been flipped on its side, on uh, 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 flipped uh, uh, to, to its opposite. And under Maduro, it's been that, you know, we can't risk actually the people having power. So the party must control these grassroots democratic organs. So we've seen a systematic process of dismantling, of replacement, of um, new laws that ensure that members of the, of the governing party have key um, powers in, in these grassroots bodies, which has obviously meant that for many local people who are not particularly interested in the government, maybe supportive of Maduro, but don't, don't really want to be uh, members of the party or, or maybe people who are just apolitical, I've seen no real reason to get involved in it, except for perhaps, obviously, there may be clientelistic reasons to get involved, you know, may give you access to um, uh, some food supplies, which, of course, are extremely important in the context of the the, the sanctions. Um, so that, that, you know, one can't deny that. But, you know, clientelistic policies are, you know, uh, very easy to find in, in, in many countries around the world. They're, they're nothing particularly socialist or, or, or radical about them. 
Um, I think that's that's the reality. The reality is that the combination of sanctions and also deliberate policies, uh, policies that the government has chosen to do, you know, we can't just blame everything that the government has done on sanctions. The government had choices. It made choices, and we shouldn't forget that. And its choices in the in those dark times, in those in those heavy times, was to restrict freedom, was to take away the rights of workers um, to to be able to um, you know uh, carry out strikes in defence of their wages, was to basically uh, curtail any dem democracy in these grassroots bodies. And so that's the challenge now that the Bolivarian process faces is now reorientating itself to whatever comes next, and we still don't know what what comes next. Um, Maduro still is the president. Uh, in that his mandate doesn't finish until January next year. So as of now, he still you know, has every right to be the president. Mm, but I think it's very hard to argue that after January, after the beginning of January, when the constitutional mandate ends and a new one does, that we'll still have a democratically elected president in Venezuela. Certainly not one that has the legitimacy of being able to you know, back its, its victory uh, by, by results that can be verified by anyone. Um, even if we have the alternate scenario where somehow a transition occurs and the opposition candidates comes in, then of course that will also be a new scenario. But either way, in January, the Bolivarian process faces a, a different scenario, one that's not faced up until now. Um, that's the situation it finds itself in. That's the reality of what it faces. Uh, let me just think about how to uh, ask this question. It's also a bit noisy here at the moment. Um, we can just edit. <laughs> edit this course um yeah so i i've seen uh quite a bit of the left um somewhat struggle to grapple with these results because on the one hand you know um you have you kind of more campus left saying well maduro is the true inheritor of the chavez regime therefore it's always right you know and we can't question this because it's the enemy of the us so um and i don't think any of us would necessarily agree with that um, but on the other hand, you know, we don't necessarily want to be supporting, regardless of the, you know, the degree of differences between the two, we don't really want to be saying, well, you know, we want to see a right wing government in Venezuela. So what are the, what are the implications for solidarity activists and kind of how do we take a principled position towards what's happening? Yeah, look, I think some people have made it more complicated than than what it really is. And I think why they get themselves tied up uh, in, in sort of knots is because they just basically haven't been following what's been occurring in Venezuela or have preferred to turn a blind eye to what's been happening in Venezuela and want to base their politics on what they imagine is occurring in Venezuela as opposed to, to the real reality. Uh, now... To me, it's pretty simple. One is, irrespective of what happened in these elections, one starting point is that US sanctions and sanctions on Venezuela must be opposed. I mean, that doesn't matter of what you think of Maduro, it doesn't matter what you think of the opposition. That's a pretty simple position. And I think most, most people, certainly progressive leftists, would, would agree with that. Maybe not all, but I genuinely think that, 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 that is the case. But then after that, this idea that somehow you we the left has to defend a repressive government that is now essentially converting itself into a dictatorship that will rule over a, a majority of society that opposes its rule as somehow being a progressive or a better outcome for ordinary working people in Venezuela. One just simply has to ask themselves, would you accept that in your own country? Let's be honest, if that happened in Australia, would any would any genuine leftist think, oh, well, better off being under a dictatorship than the Liberal Party or or the the the, the one you know, Pauline Hansen's one nation, if we want to refer to the far right? Uh, I don't I don't think anyone would. And, I, and I'll be surprised if you could convince anyone in Australia of that argument. So why why would we ask Venezuelan workers to do to, to do that instead? Um why not instead? actually speak to Venezuelan activists, as I've been doing over the last few few weeks, trying to interview people from a wide variety of the left, those who have been opposed to Maduro from the start, to those who still support Maduro and everyone in, in between, and trying to hear, hear their voices. And I think actually when, when you start to listen to what they have to say, the realities they live, when you start to actually analyse the context of Venezuela, you really start to see the sad reality is that they're stuck between a rock and a hard place. 
because no one, no one believes that if the opposition are in power, that's somehow going to fix all of Venezuela's problems. But neither will living in a dictatorship where the scale of repression in Venezuela today is basically saying that it's been unseen in that country for so long. The scale of repression is so far that one of the most common things you hear when talking to people on the left in Venezuela is that you have now an entire generation of young people who want nothing to do with anything associated with socialism. It's saying, it's, for instance, it's not saying too dissimilar to what you see in Eastern European countries where left and socialism, words like that, are just identified with Stalinism. And so therefore, you know, people don't want to truck on that, you know. That's what we have today in Venezuela. Large swathes of population just do not want anything to do with the left because the government assumes left as its discourse. And so therefore, you know, people just accept that as truth and say, well, if that, that's what the left represents, um, then that's not what I want to be. And I think the most indicative, uh, you know, re revelation of just how far um, this sort of ideological shift has occurred in Venezuelan society. And this is where I go back to how so often these, these discussions are so removed from the reality of Venezuela is that it's worth, I always think back, it's always worth comparing um, the 2003, elect, the first time Maduro gets elected in 2013, or, or if you want to, the, the last time Chavez gets elected at the end of 2012 compared to these elections, because they're very revealing. They're very revealing on the one hand, on the on the level of democracy in that country, because in 2013, when the opposition said there was fraud, um, not only did the CNE publish all of its results, the PSUV, the governing socialist party, released all of its tally sheets to say that it, it verified that it matched with what the CNE had. And the CNE went to the point of counting, because every apart from the electronic system, um, a receipt is published. So you have a manual, you can manually count the votes in Venezuela if you want. And the CNE manually went through and counted 100% of the votes to verify that everything matched. The electronic system, the tally sheets given to parties, and the manual votes, all of them were done. Compare that to today, where none of that has been done, and in fact, deliberately has been obscured. So that's one, one indication of how much has changed. But I think another revealing thing to, to look at is when you look at the election campaigns, because the election campaign when Chavez ran and when Maduro ran was centered around the politics of the Bolivarian revolution. So much so that the opposition had to rely on presenting Enrique Capriles, who we can talk about his actual politics, but I think most people would accept sort of he's a kind of a centre-right candidate, you know, whose entire policy was basically when he ran um, against Chavez, his platform was largely, look, we're going to keep the good things of Chavez. Um, we just don't want the, the, you know, the undemocratic aspects of, you know, we just need fresh change. You know, Chavez has been in power for too long. And then when he ran against Maduro, again, was we're going to keep the good things of, of Chavez, but Maduro is not Chavez. You know, that's why we need fresh change. So the, the, the spectrum on the right was seeking to move left to try to capture the vote of the people because it realized it couldn't come out with a, a right wing platform. Compare that to today where the main opposition candidate is someone clearly aligned with the far right, no real qualms of, of doing that, makes no pretenses of trying to, you know, keep any legacy of Chavez whatsoever. And as a result of that, even if you accept the opposition, the, 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 um, the official results, 44% of the population voted for that. But if you, you know, look at the opposition's votes, maybe somewhere closer to 60, 70% of Venezuelan society voted for that. They voted for a candidate clearly aligned with the far right and didn't have any qualms with that because they saw that as a lesser evil than what exists now. Now, that can only be explained by the huge shift that's occurred under the Maduro government. There's no other real explanation to that. Sanctions are part of that, but so are Maduro's uh, um, policies. So to somehow say that the best outcome for the left is defending the Maduro government, irrespective of whether they've carried out fraud, and thinking that that's a way that the left can advance, particularly in Venezuela, but even internationally, as if somehow that's an argument that progressive forces can sort of make a case for, to me seems like a dead end uh, for the left. Um, instead, we should say, look, the unfortunate thing is that Venezuelans are in a really hard situation. No matter who's in government, it's going to be real difficult. And our solidarity must continue to be uh, with the people of Venezuela. And that involves both their right to not live under a regime of sanctions, but also their right to have their, their democratic votes they cast counted and that whoever they elect to be their, be their president, just like anyone else who lives in a democracy in, in any part of the world should have.
Thanks so much, Fred, um, for your time today. And I would highly recommend people, if you're listening to this and you want to find out a bit more, uh, as, as you mentioned, um, Fred's done a bunch of interviews with uh, various uh, people um, on the ground in Venezuela and following uh, the results quite closely. And you can read all of those interviews on uh, links.org.au and also on Green Left. Um, I'll also point people to a couple of uh, forums that are coming up uh, in the next week uh, that Fred's going to be addressing, uh, making sense of Venezuela's presidential election. So the first one of those is on September 24 at uh, 7 p.m. Um, in Eastern Standard Time. Um, so that's online, so you can join that uh, via Zoom and you can find more information uh, well, actually, I'll put both of these uh, events into the link in the description, but they're also on the Green Left website. The second one is on the 28th of September at 3 p.m. in Maganjan or Brisbane. And so that's an in-person gathering, uh, I think, that you'll be joining from online, Fred. I, I think that's, that's right. right. Uh, and that's at the Albion Peace Centre. Um, but I think people can also join that from online as well. So there's two, two uh, forums coming up if you've got more questions you want to ask or uh, things you want to find out, I definitely recommend attending those and those are being hosted by the Socialist Alliance. Uh, but yeah, thanks again, Fred. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to add before we wrap up? No, look, I just really want to encourage people to, if they can, to attend those forums. Of course, uh, you know, the, I'm not saying they're the be all and end all of all, all the information, but, you know, as I started with the, the trying to understand Venezuela is, co is complex because of the, the, the information is so polarized, it's so distorted, um, but that's from both sides, you know, it's not just the case that you only have the, the Western media propaganda about Venezuela, there's also plenty plenty of Venezuelan state propaganda that, that floats around as well. Um, so, of course, you know, and if you haven't been following Venezuela for, for the last few years, I'm sure that many, for many, it came a surprise, the idea that even Maduro could lose an election. Um, but I think it's that's why I encourage people to come along and to ask ask the questions that that, that, that they have, you know, because uh, you know the the ability to to find that information elsewhere is is very difficult. And I've obviously encourage people to to read Green Left uh, and also Links International Journal of Socialist Renewal, where we've been all running longer longer interviews and pieces there about the situation in Venezuela. Amazing. Thanks so much, Fred, and we'll talk to you again soon. Yeah. Thanks, Fred. So now I'm excited to be uh, talking to the legendary Sue Bolton. It's people who don't know, Sue's a long-standing Socialist Alliance councillor on the Marybeck Council and is currently campaigning to win her fourth term on council. And Sue's led campaigns to prevent the outsourcing of council pools, aged care services, um, saving green spaces, and has campaigned for public transport and public housing. And Sue has also led the charge on Palestine solidarity at the council level successfully getting council to condemn Israel's genocide, wave the Palestinian flag, call for ceasefire and support Palestinian refugees. So welcome to the podcast, Sue. So I just kind of listed a few of your achievements over your time on council. Um, but what I think is interesting is the kind of approach that you've taken uh, for these campaigns, where you've always sought to kind of engage the community in the campaigns. I was just wondering if you could talk to a little bit about why you uh, go for this approach. Well, I'm an activist force on council and quite often when council officers maybe make bureaucratic decisions and a good example is that issue of the Faulkner pool. Um, the council was planning to redevelop the Faulkner Leisure Centre but at the same time as they redeveloped the Faulkner Leisure Centre, they were planning to close the Faulkner outdoor pool um, and just jazz up the gym and, and the insides of the pool area. And, that, and, and that's partly because they make more money out of the gym than out of people coming to buy tickets to use the outdoor pool. And I, while I'm not a swimmer, I knew that there would be people who'd want to save the pool. I didn't want people to find out about it till after it was closed. I wanted people to have a chance to save it. And the council was sneaky with how they talked about it. They described it as repurposing the pool. They didn't say close the pool. They said they were repurposing the outdoor pool. Who knows what repurposing is? Um, it was not open and honest. So I got the word out to the community so that we had a chance to build a campaign to save the pool. 
And we did this um, in the second year of COVID and lockdowns and so forth. We had a protest. We had people coming to council meetings, presenting petitions. And we also, uh, the campaign also contacted all of the local councillors because everyone gets to vote on the decision. And that meant that we one by one won over the other councillors to agree to saving the outdoor pool. And we won. We won that decision. And if we hadn't have built a community campaign, I might have, I would have argued to save the pool uh, in the council chamber. And I would have been one vote in favour of keeping the pool. And maybe a couple of other councillors might have voted with me. Um, but I could have said, yes, I'm a hero. I voted the right way. But I wouldn't have had a win for the community. And by building the community campaign, we actually had a win for the whole community. So I'm an activist voice on council, and that's the approach I've taken with lots of issues. Yes, it almost makes you more than just, you know, one vote on council or one voice speaking up. You're kind of uh, able to leverage uh, all these different con concerns from different people to come together um, for issues that people are really concerned about. And, and one of those things that you've consistently kind of fought uh, off is the outsourcing uh, and privatisation. So how important have these campaigns been for the community? Um, these campaigns, I think, are really important and also might be more important than some people realise because so much stuff has been outsourced by all levels of government in recent years. And so that a lot of governments and local councils have really lost a lot of expertise and they're really contract managers, managers of contracts, rather than providing direct services. And you can think of many examples um, of that. And that's what probably landed us in the shit with um, COVID um, because the health departments have outsourced a lot of their work and don't have the same level of expertise any longer. So some of the things I've been involved in is trying to stop the council selling off council land, which is public land. Um, I've also fought to try and stop the outsourcing of council's um, home care services. Um, I was unsuccessful with, the, with saving the respite service for families of children with disabilities. Um, the council farmed that off into NDIS, but not everyone's eligible for NDIS. So some families lost that service. Um, I was successful with saving council's in-home aged care service um, because, you know, council has a really great ex expert um, staff and the private services are all highly casualised. Uh, I did stop the privatisation of Council's Waste Collection Service north of Bell Street, um, but the Southern Waste Collection is uh, was outsourced many years ago before I ever came onto Council to a company called Citywide. And if I get re-elected, I want to bring that Southern Waste Collection Services back into council hands. Yeah, awesome. That sounds that sounds like a great um, campaign. Um, you recently wrote an article for Green Left about the whole kind of YIMBY or yes in my backyard versus NIMBY debate, and you know what that really what that's kind of obscuring or what that really means. And so I wanted you if you could talk to that, and also what kind of solutions are you putting for addressing the housing crisis, which is obviously such a big issue for so many people at the moment? Well, I think the um, the YIMBY, which means yes in my backyard, as you pointed out, is a movement which has created over the last few years, comes from the United States originally. And I believe this movement has very close links with developers, um, especially in Brisbane. Um, and it's not that transparent about any of that. And I think the YIMBY group is really uh, taking advantage of the desperation people feel for housing, both um, for renting and for owning. And there are all sorts of fake solutions being put forward by governments um, for, house, for 
so-called affordable housing, but a lot of them are actually fake solutions, not real solutions. The Yimbis uh, appear to have, um, their main argument appears to be that the same argument that the mainstream politicians are making, which is there's a lack of housing supply. That's why the cost of housing is so high. But I think um, if that argument was true, then we would have had cheap housing during COVID lockdowns because people weren't allowed to come to Australia. A lot of people, international students, temporary um, workers from overseas were, you know, went back home. And so there was a net population reduction during that period. But the cost of housing came down very little and didn't stay down for very long. Um, so I think there's a fault in that argument. They also don't take into account um, people, investors who buy up multiple dwellings, flats or houses and leave some vacant as um, as investments, hoping for the, um, the prices to go up before they sell them and make a killing. So they don't address issues of land banking or anything like that. They just want, um, they appear to want all restrictions on development removed. And um, and th so they slam NIMBYs. Now, there is such a thing as NIMBY, uh, not in my backyard. People who don't want something in their neighbourhood, like don't want a freeway or tollway through their neighbourhood, but they're happy to let it happen in someone else's neighbourhood. That's really what a NIMBY is. Uh, they don't care about others, but only care about themselves. But quite often, um, campaigns around development issues are not NIMBY, um, NIMBY campaigns, because there may be some really well-justified amenity concerns. And you can understand um, someone objecting to a development if... Um, you know, say an apartment block and their house are really close, like centimetres away from each other, and your only habitable room, which has access to natural sunlight, is going to have the natural sunlight blocked by a development. So there are real amenity issues. And also within apartment blocks, sometimes the developers build apartments so that there's no access to natural sunlight. There might be a little light beam um, that's directing sunlight from the sky down through the roof cavity into your flat, but it's not natural sunlight um, or maybe the, no natural ventilation. And so there are real, re there do need to be, it does need to be regulation of developers in the same way that you want to have regulation of the mining industry so that you can't just set up a mine anywhere, anytime, without any regard for water or, or the environment. Um, I do support, you know, restrictions on development um, in natural national parks and, and all sorts of places. I think there does need to be proper opportunities for the community to have a say over all forms of development, whether it's building houses and blocks of units in the city or or something or some sort of development in the countryside. The solution with housing is and the cost of housing is really simple. It is taking some of the housing out of the market and building it as public housing. Now we know that we've got governments, the mainstream parties, the big parties do not want to build public housing in the same way that they don't want public hospitals or public schools and they're nibbling away at those and they've already sold off lots of public services and it's the same that's the same reason why they refuse to build public housing and public housing is the only genuine affordable housing um, community housing is not genuinely affordable. Various schemes of developers are not genuinely affordable. The build to rent model of some developers um, is also not affordable because generally they're for upmarket renters and so they actually charge a higher amount of rent than most of the surrounding, most of the market rent around them. 
and we know market rent is unaffordable for a lot of people. So unless governments actually build public housing, the homelessness crisis is going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And I haven't seen anything from the Yimbies talking about the need for public housing. It's all about removing restrictions on developers. Yeah, 100%. I think it's pretty clear that public housing is the best solution for, for all the reasons you just outlined. Um, to, to move on to the next kind of question, I was uh, I mentioned at the start how you uh, led some of the charge for Palestine solidarity from councils. Um, I know Mary Beck was one of the first uh, handful of councils to pass uh, Palestine solidarity motions and uh, you initiated that initial motion. Um, there are some kind of people who argue that councils shouldn't take a stand on international issues. It should all just be about, you know, the roads and the rubbish and things like that. Um, so what's your kind of take on, on that uh, argument? My view is that people who say, oh, councils should only focus on roads, rates and rubbish, generally they do want councils to take a stand on some so broader social justice issues, which might be an international issue if it's one that they support. It's only when it's an issue they don't support that they raise this argument. And actually, councils are responsible for a lot more than roads, rates and rubbish. They're responsible for maternal and child health care. They're responsible for playgrounds, par having adequate parks, footpaths, all sorts of things. But also most councils have um, some sort of social justice, community well-being kind of policies, human rights policies about supporting the rights of different parts of our community, whether it's the queer community, um, First Nations people, different migrant groups, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a basis for um taking up broader issues and having a social justice response to providing council services. Now, I suspect, going all the way back to the Second World War, that councils probably did have positions opposing Nazi Germany during the Second World War. I'm sure that would be the case. I haven't really investigated that, but I'm sure that would be the case. But certainly going back to the 70s and 80s, there are lots of examples of councils um, being involved in broader international issues which have a relevance in our society. In the 1980s, councils were involved in the nuclear-free zone movement. A lot of councils declared themselves nuclear-free zones when there were massive uh, rallies all over Australia calling for an end to nuclear weapons. Um, then we, I, I suspect we would have seen councils moving motions around the explosion of nuclear tests by the French government in the Pacific. I'm not sure about that one, but I suspect we would have seen, seen that. Certainly um, during the time of uh, East Timorese, in, when, when the East Timorese people voted for independence and then there was a massive slaughter against the Timorese by Indo the Indonesian military, um, councils actually took stances along with federal and state governments in support of the East Timorese. And we've got a heritage of that today with councils all over Australia who that have friendship, um, friendship arrangements with East Timorese villages. That still happens today. And there've been other examples of councils supporting a particular group of people that's facing injustice overseas because there are a lot of people in their local area who are, um, you know, who are really um, anguished about that issue. I met a woman who lost 120 members of her family in Gaza. This is in December, early December last year. So. I was approached by people. I also have a personal belief this is an international humanitarian disaster, um, which the world is um, allowing to occur. So I think that when the federal and state governments have failed us, then we actually need to take a stand at a local council level. So that's why I moved the first 
motion in support of Palestine and for an end to the genocide in Meribeth Council. Yeah, there's this idea of like um, council is probably the most accessible level of government for ordinary people to. It's 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 hard to make uh, call up Anthony Albanese or whoever um, in the federal level, but it's quite more accessible to talk to your councillors. So it's a way that you know that uh, everyday issues can be addressed for people. And I think the Palestine solidarity issue has affected so many people um, across the country. Um, I just wanted to, uh, I guess, ask a bit more detail on what has the council done so far on Palestine and, and what else would you like to see council do um, going forward? Well, so there've been a couple of motions on Palestine in Meribeth. So the first motion was one I moved in November, which was quite a detailed motion. Um, and it called for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. It called for an, an immediate end to the siege to allow unlimited supplies of food, medical supplies, um, electricity and construction materials and all the necessities alive to be allowed to um, be brought into Gaza. It also called for the federal government to immediately cut t all ties, economic, political, diplomatic, uh, military ties with Israel. That means banning, arming Israel. And then the last part of it was, uh, uh, so the two other parts of it, one was about um, council being part of the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement and ceasing to um, have contracts with companies that support the occupation of Palestine. And the last point was to fly the Palestinian flag permanently until there's a permanent ceasefire. And my motion has had um, a concrete impact. Now, council's written to the federal government uh, with the call for immediate permanent ceasefire and sanctions against Israel, uh, et cetera, to force Israel to come to the party and sign a ceasefire. Now, that's all gone off to the federal government and federal government doesn't care. They just snubbed it. Um, but one thing which council has done, which has a real impact, is that council is now in the process of ending contracts with four companies that um, supply to the Israeli military and and support the genocide in Gaza. So that's a real concrete um, concrete impact. Um, one of those uh, companies that used to buy from it no longer buys from is Hewlett Packard, which is one of the big targets on the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement list. Um, the rest are in confidence, uh, unfortunately. Um, council is terrified of being, about being sued. But I think that is a very concrete thing. One of the company, there was another company that council was um, considering ending contracts with, but that company ended up divesting from uh, is, from. Uh, you know, any arrangement it had with the Israeli military. So we didn't need to boycott that particular company. But going forward, the council has something in its procurement that it won't um, buy or, or purchase anything from companies that are involved with weapons production. I think that, and that doesn't just apply to Palestine and Gaza, it implies more broadly. And I think that is a good thing. There's a lot of horrific wars that uh, Australia is involved in sending military supplies to enable. So I think that's really important. But also the other thing that's important with my motion is that the moral support for the community, especially people who come from the region and particularly from Gaza and Palestine, but also more broadly, there four and four out of five Australians think there should be a ceasefire. There are people like disability rights activists who've set up a group um, calling for uh, an end to the genocide because they're thinking about the implications of people with disabilities in Gaza who are being ordered by the Israeli government from here to there and m more people with um, disabilities being you know, uh, are having disabilities caused as we speak. So I think it is an important moral support, 
because people, a lot of people feel that the government is only speaking out when white people, i.e. white people in Ukraine, are affected by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but don't give a stuff about brown people or Muslims. And people feel very acutely that there's a real double standard, and I agree with them. Yeah, definitely. And a lot of councils have did uh, make... Uh, solidarity statements with Ukraine when the Russian invasion kicked off and some of those same people, same councillors refused to comment on Gaza. So that makes it pretty clear. Um, so on the podcast over the past uh, month or so, we've been talking to various um, socialist uh, candidates for council and, and councillors um, in kind of a connection with the local government elections that happened in New South Wales last week and uh, that are coming up in Victoria. Um, and we've been kind of trying to get a sense of, of, of what the role of a, a socialist councillor is or an activist councillor and, and how to kind of think about that. Now, we haven't really touched on this aspect. There's, there's some people on the kind of, uh, on the left who think that, you know, socialists shouldn't uh, focus on electoral politics. I think like it's a waste of time and, and it should all be about, you know, movements on the street and things like that, which is also obviously very important. Um, but through these discussions we've been having over the last few weeks, it's also been pretty clear that a socialist councillor can have quite a big impact on the on a uh, on that community level. Um, so I guess I just wanted to ask you as a kind of final question how you think about the role of a socialist councillor or an activist councillor. Um, yeah, what, what's your thoughts on this? Well, my view or Socialist Alliance's view is very different to say the view of politicians who are in Liberal and Labor, and also even very different to Greens politicians, because um, the focus of all of those parties is purely on the parliamentary or council debate. And I've got a different approach as a socialist and also as a trade unionist as well, um, that you actually win things on the ground. Now, that doesn't mean that the electoral contest is unimportant. I think it is. And you can see um, with something I was involved in a long time ago, actually 10 years ago now, um, the campaign against the East-West Link, which was a big toll road um, that was the government, Liberal Party government at that point, planned to drive through um, the middle of Melbourne and would have been totally destructive. And we, I, init I initiated a, pro a motion on Maribet Council um, and then for a public meeting and a few other things, um, then we had that public meeting and we leafleted it to set up a group called Maribet, or at that time it was before we, the council changed its name, so it was Molland um, Community Against the Tunnel. And my role of moving motions on council and getting council support for the campaign gave confidence to the local community to build the campaign, that it was possible to have a big campaign. And then the campaign also, the fact that we were able to mobilise so well, we had a really strong local march of 1,200 people or so up Sydney Road and some of the local um, community groups had expected only about 200 people, but actually it was a well over a thousand. And I think the fact that that demonstrated such strong support that it also kept putting pressure on the council to keep doing various things. And in the end, the council took legal action um, as well, um, took out an injunction over the East West Link. And that was also helpful because. At that point, Labor was in opposition and it gave the Labor Party the fig leaf it needed to um, say that they would rip up the contract. And that was really partly because of a marginal seat contest with the Greens that they had in the inner city. But really, uh, but we had a victory, like there's lots of different elements of that campaign. But if we hadn't have had an on the streets campaign that was backed up by a councillor, who also supported the building of the On the Streets campaign, we would not have had the success uh, um, of um, getting rid of the East-West Link. And 
so I think that that is it. Uh, I see my role as being a bit like a union delegate when an issue comes up that affects more than just an individual person. Then you see if there are other people who are concerned, maybe by having a petition, um, setting up street stalls, um, and you, if you start to build a bit of a group who've got an interest in that issue, and then you might organise a rally or people to come and ask questions at council meetings, and you build a campaign, and that's how you win. And even though I've mostly only ever been one vote on council, um, the community mobilisation can push the councillors over into supporting a particular issue. Um, no doubt some of that's influenced by wanting to get votes and because something's a popular issue, but um, but it, that's well, how you win and that's how you win federal and state level as well. You actually have to have community campaigns. In the case of unions, it's industrial action as well. Um, but that's really how you win. And, yeah, so the two things, for, um, you know, so it's not just enough to be elected. You need to be an active, have an activist approach when you're elected. Um, and also I think the community campaigns are also important because even for a socialist getting elected, it's also possible for you to go soft in the position because there's so many threads trying to pull you in a neoliberal direction. Um, it's not easy um, to work your way through the bureaucracy to advocate progressive uh, policies and issues and, and responses. Um, there's a thousand and one threads that set, that um, where federal and state government try and tug local council in a particular direction where money is uh, available or grant money is available for this project as long as you get, agree to a public-private partnership or, or whatever. And so if you are just relying on negotiations in council and voting in council, you would get unstuck with a lot of those things because they're trying to wrap something that's progressive up with something that's reactionary. and. The only way through that is really through basing yourself in the community, in community campaigns. And then sometimes those community campaigns can open up the political space to actually fight for a full victory, not just something where you have to compromise on public private partnerships or, or whatever. So, uh, yeah, so it's, it, it helps keep. Um, councillors, even progressive and radical councillors, you can go soft and um, you need that um, pressure from within the community to actually think about how to push things. Definitely. And I think um, you've given a lot of useful thoughts for people involved in community campaigns across the country. And um, yeah, obviously, good luck going into the upcoming elections, which are on October 5th, but I believe it's postal vote only. So uh, postal votes kick off two weeks before that. Is that right? So so it's in October. So the final date um, by which um, uh, the uh, ballot papers or the envelopes containing ballot papers have to be marked is um, the before the 25th of October, but ballot packs will start to get posted out from the 7th to the 10th of October. They'll be going going out in batches each day and they'll arrive very quickly. So um, people really need to look out for something in their letterbox in early to mid-October uh, because that will be your ballot pack. And it is really important to vote even if you don't really know your local councils, like a lot of people don't really know their local councils, don't know what the issues are on their local council. But there are some really reactionary, right-wing, racist councils that will be standing in a lot of areas. And you do want to have progressive councillors elected who will fight for the rights of the community. Because even though at the moment you might feel that you don't have any particular issues with the council, and that council's irrelevant to you, often you don't realise how bad councils are until 
an issue arises and suddenly you realise how bad councils or councillors are and when you need their support for something. And so it is really worthwhile people um, really ha checking checking out who's standing and voting for a progressive candidate um, and not allowing some right-wing racist to be elected. Yes, definitely. And um, you're also running with a team of uh, three other candidates within the Maribeck area. For people who don't know, the Victorian uh, Council elections this time around have moved to a ward-based system. So uh, there'll be a Socialist Alliance candidate in, I think it's four of the wards within Maribeck Council. Um, and we'll put a link in the podcast description if you want to click through and find out a little bit more about the campaign or, or help out in any way. Um, but yeah, thanks again, Sue, for joining us and uh, good luck with the rest of the campaign. Thanks very much. That's about all we've got time for on this week's episode of the Green Left News Podcast. Thanks for listening. Uh, if you like what you heard this on this episode and you want to find out more, you can go to greenleft.org.au. And if you want to become a supporter, it's only $5 a month at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. It makes a big difference to help us continue uh, doing this podcast and all the other work that Green Left does. Um, make sure to check the links in the description for the Venezuela forums that we spoke about and also to find out more about Sue Bolton's election campaign. We've also put links in the description for the launch of the Borlu Activist Centre um, launch party, which is happening on the 28th of September. Is that correct, Riley? I think that's correct. Yep, on the 28th. 28th of September and we also put a link for the uh, rising tide people's blockade of the world's largest coal port which is happening in November you can find all those events and heaps more on the green left calendar so highly recommend checking that out greenleft.org.au forward slash events um, but yeah thanks again for listening and we'll see you on the next episode bye